Hello class, week nine, we are doing an introduction to number theory. Number one, in a previous unit, we learned that a multiplicative statement has the form multiplier times multiplicand equals product. For example, three copies of eight make 24, or three times eight equals 24. Recall that is also true that eight copies of three make 24. This is the commutative property of multiplication. But in this unit, we will not focus on the distinction between the role of the multiplier and the multiplicand, and we will simply refer to them each as factors. So 3 and 8 are said to be factors of 24. Also in this unit, we will only discuss natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So no, no negative uh, integers for this particular uh, week. Now the act of factoring a number, or the factorization of a number, is the act of representing that number as a product of two or more other numbers. Consider the factoring of 24 by expressing it as the product of 3 and 8. Now there are many ways to communicate this as indicated in this table. So here's a few ways to say it in the left column. You can say 3 times 8 is a factoring of 24 or that 24 factors into 3 times 8. Or if you want to focus on just the 3 there's lots of ways to mention that 3 is a factor. You can say 3 is a factor of 24. Now this doesn't identify what the other factor that corresponds to 3 would be, in this case 8, but we're just going to focus on describing the 3 right now. 3 is a factor of 24. 3 is a divisor of 24. 3 divides 24. All of those mean the same thing. Or you can start with the 24 and say 24 is divisible by 3. Or 24 is a multiple of 3. And then, of course, you can say those same five statements, but focusing on the 8. 8 is a factor of 24. 8 is a divisor of 24. 8 divides 24. 24 is divisible by 8, and 24 is a multiple of 8. These are all synonymous ways to communicate uh, similar ideas. And they're easily confused by students initially. Like, you would not want to say something like, you will not, don't say this one backwards. Sometimes people say 24 divides 8. Now you want to say 24 is divisible by 8, but it's 8 that divides 24. Now often there are several ways of factoring a number. List all possible factors, all factored pairs, and one factor triplet of 24. If helpful, use the number list of numbers below to aid in the process of elimination. So we're going to try to just determine all the numbers that are possible factors of 24. Now in this list, 1 should always be one of our numbers because 1 is a number that is a factor of any other number of of any number because for example consider 3 right you could write 3 as 3 times 1 so 1 and 3 are both the factors of 3 which which tells us that 24 is also a factor of 24 so given a number such as 24 that number itself and the number 1 will always be in the list of possible factors. Now we think about 2. Can we write 24 as 2 times something? And the answer is yes. So we can write 24 as 2 times 12. So we get to include the 2. And its counterpart would be uh, the 12. So that's going to be a factor as well. How about 3? Does 3 divide into 24? Is 24 divisible by 3? And the answer is yes. 3 divides 24, or 3 is a factor of 24, or 3 is a divisor of 24, or 24 is a multiple of 3. These are all ways to say the same thing, but 3 should be in our list of factors. And its corresponding, its partner, would be 3 times 8. So 8 should be in our list as well. 4. Does 4 divide 24? The answer is yes. 4 times 6. So 4 and 6 should both be in our list. How about 5? Five, nope, five is the first number, at least, at least working this way, uh, that does not divide 24. Or you can also say does not divide into 24. Or 24 is not divisible by five. That is, in producing a whole number result. Now we will later learn that it's possible to use fractions and do five times a fraction, that will give us 24. But if we're only focusing on whole numbers, the counting numbers, then we would say 24 is not divisible by 5. 
When fractions come into play, we are going to change that story and say, yes, 24 is divisible by 5. Well, more on that to come. Uh, but there aren't, aren't two integers that where 5 is one of them, right, right? That you multiply, you get 24. 7 is also not a factor. Neither is 8, neither is 10, neither is 11. And technically, you could stop when you get halfway through uh, the list. Like You don't need to do 13 through 23. You might ask yourself why that is. Well, 2 was a factor, and 2 times 12 made 24. So there's going to be no number in this area here because it would require a number between 1 and 2 to multiply to it to make 24. And since we're only working with non-fractional numbers, we're working with um, uh, whole numbers only, so we're not considering numbers between 1 and 2. So as far as whole numbers are concerned, what I have boxed off are the entire list of possible factors. And so let's go ahead and formally list them here. Uh, so we'll say possible factors. Possible whole number factors. 1 is in that list. 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and then finally 24. And of course, you can notice a symmetry between these. Uh, 1 times 24 makes 24. So now we're going to list all factor pairs. So actually say, hey, what two numbers when you, uh, how can you write 24 in different products? So you could say uh, possible pairs, factor pairs. So we say 1 times 24 will make 24. Then you can go 2 times 12, and you see this symmetry that's going to happen here. Let me move this down. 3 times 8 and 4 times 6. So 1 times 24, 2 times 12 is a factor pairing. That makes 24. 3 times 8 is another one, and 4 times 6. These are all the possible factor pairs. Then uh, it asks for one factor triplet. And there's many of them, but let's just do one. And we can uh, essentially factor one of these other numbers. doesn't really matter which one I pick. I'm going to do the 2 times 12, and I'm going to factor the 12 a little bit more and say 2 times 3 times 4. This is called a factor triplet. When you multiply these three numbers together, you will get 24 as well. And you could use the associative property, right? Do 2 times 3 first and get 6 times 4, that makes 24. Or you can do the 3 times 4 first, get 12, and then times it by the 2, that gives you 24. Or you could do the commutative property, multiply the 2 and 4 first. In other words, uh, switch the 3 and 4 around, and then do the 2 and 4 first, and then times the 3, and that gives you 8 times 3, also 24. But uh, because of commutativity and associativity, it really doesn't matter the order in which you write these things nor does it really matter the order in which you write these ones. So if I write 2 times 12 and someone else writes 12 times 2, I'm going to consider that the same factor pair. I don't, I'm not going to consider those different factor pairs. Okay, now we're going to repeat this process, but do it for 11 and then again for 36. All right, so let's go 11 first. And let's do the factors. And the most we have to do is go 1 through half of 11. So I, I'll just say these out loud. Does 1 divide into 11? Yes. 1 is always should be in a list of factors. Does 2 divide into 11? No. It's 2 times 5.5, .5, but 5.5 .5 is not a whole number. We're only thinking whole numbers. So we can't use 2. How about 3? No. 4, no. It's going to turn out there's no other number that uh, divides evenly, or that when I say divides evenly, I mean it divides into the number and produces a whole number quotient. So the only two factors are 1 and 11. So the only uh, factor pair is, is just that. It's 1 times 11. It's the only way to write 11 as a product of two counting numbers. And the counting numbers are the natural numbers. When I say counting numbers, I mean natural numbers. That means 1, 2, 3, etc. And then for a triplet, uh, there's no way to do a triplet unless you want to use one a couple times, I suppose. I mean, you could make this argument. 
and say that 1 times 1 times 11 uh, is a product of three counting numbers that makes 11. So I guess that's technically a fair thing to do, although not interesting. Now let's do 36. And let's keep track of the factors. Let me just copy this. Let's get rid of that. Let's put this up. Okay, the factors of 36. One should always start your list. Does 2 divide into 36? Yes, 2 times 18. In fact, sometimes it's helpful to do the pairings uh, first. And then you can list the uh, factors above. So I'm going to do the pairings first. So let's say pairs. We have 1 times 36 is one way to get 36. How about 2? Yes, 2 times 18 will make 36. How about 3? 3 also works. 3 times 12 will make 36. How about 4? Yes, it works. 4 times 9 will make 36. Uh, 5. Well, 5 does not divide evenly into 36. Neither does 7. Neither does 8. And now we get to 9. 9 does, but we have already have the 9-4 pairing, so I don't need to put another pairing here. 10 does not. 11 does not. 12 does, and we get this pairing. In fact, we are going to discover that we've already, once we start cycling through the same numbers that have already been included in our list somewhere, in our pairs, then we're pretty much done. Uh, 13 does not divide into 39, neither does 14, nor does 15, nor does 16, nor does 17, but 18 will, and it's 18 times 2, and then no others will up until we get to 36. So now we're going to list, this is all of our factor pairings. Um, oh, wait, I, I forgot one. Hello. 6 times 6. We did not do 6 times 6. Did I skip over that? I don't remember how I skipped that. A little brain fart, I suppose. Um, 5 does not, 6 does, 7 does not, 8 does not, 9... Okay, now we once we get to 9, we get to the symmetry starting to happen, and we're done. Somehow I just did a brain fart and missed the 6. Okay, so now we're going to start listing all these numbers that were in the pairs, but in, in order. So the 1... 2 is a factor, 3 is a factor, uh, 4 is a factor, 6 is a factor, and once we have we have a 6 times 6 that makes uh, the 36, so we're kind of, we're at the, the middle of our list here. So now we can start thinking 9 times what, or, or 4 times what makes 36, and that answer is 4 times 9. And then we can say 3 times what makes 36, 12, right? 2 times what makes 36, 24, and then finally 1 times 36. And so here we have uh, the list of possible factors of 36. And then we only had to make one triplet, and there's lots of options here. Uh, let's take the uh, this 3 times 12 and make a triplet out of this. So 3 times 6 times 2. And there's one example of a triplet. Of course, we could also make quadruplets and, and etc. I could have broken that and said this and make a quadruple a four-term product, if you will. More on that to come. All right, a quick a little review about what an exponent is. An exponent, or a power, is a number written as a superscript to another number called the base, which indicates how many times the base should be multiplied with itself. Now, this is, uh, I think everyone here is already familiar with what an exponent is. And in this unit, we will only consider exponents and bases that are natural numbers. Again, just reminding you, reminding you of that. And when you see the symbol A with the superscript B up there in the corner like that, you say it by saying A raised to the B, or just simply A to the B. Don't say A, B, because if you just say A, B, then that makes me think you're putting A, B next to each other, which makes me think multiplication. Uh, let's do an example. Uh, let's put a base of 3 and an exponent of 1. Well, that just means do just 3. So 3 raised to the 1 is 3, or 3 to the 1 is 3. 3 raised to the 2, or 3 to the 2, or you can also say in this case 3 squared is 3 times... Th this means 3 times 3, and that gives me 9. 3 raised to the 3... Right, separate these... This means multiply the base with itself three times. So we do three bases multiplied, and you get 27. You can also say here uh, 3 cubed is another way to say an exponent of 3. Let me write that down. You can say 3 cubed in this case, 
or you can say over here 3 squared. And then all the other powers we just say raised to the. So if I have 3 raised to the 4 or 3 to the 4, that just means do 3 with itself 4 times and that will give us an 81, right, etc. Okay, now a number is called prime if its only possible factors are 1 and itself. So looking backwards, 11 was an example of a prime number because the only possible factors were 1 and itself. There were no other numbers between 1 and 11 that divided 11. Otherwise, the number is said to be composite. Now, the number 1 itself is not considered prime or composite. Some people like to say it's a prime number. We're going to say no. The only prime numbers have to be 2 or higher. Now, there are infinitely many prime numbers, and there's infinitely many composite numbers. And we're going to write down the first 10 primes and the first 10 composite numbers below. So it's a prime and then composite. Let's not include 1 in either list, because 1 is not considered prime or composite. But 2 is 2 prime or composite. It's a prime number. In fact, it's going to turn out to be the only even prime number, because all other even numbers are divisible by 2. 3. 3 is also a prime number. 4 is not. 4 is composite, because 4 is divisible by 2. It factors into 2 times 2. 5. 5 is prime. 6 is not. 6 is composite. 6 factors to 2 times 3. Uh, 7 is prime. 8 is not. 8 factors into 2 times 4. 9 is composite. It factors to 3 times 3. 10 is composite. It's 2 times 5. 11 is prime. 12 is composite. It's 6 times 2, or 3 times 4. 13 is prime. 14 is composite. Every even number should be in the composite list at this point, so it's only the only even prime is 2. All the other primes have to be odd, because every other even number is divisible by 2. Uh, so 15. 15 is composite. 5 times 3. 16 is composite. 4 times 4, or 2 times 8. 17 makes the list up in prime. Now, how many do we have? We only have to do until we have 10 in each list, so there's 5. I just need one more composite number, and that list will be done. Uh, 18. 18 is composite. And then we'll just say etc. And I think I now have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3. Yeah, I have 10 numbers in this list. There's the first 10 composite numbers. Now we just got to keep going in to get some more primes. Uh, 19 is prime. 20 is not. 21 is not. 22 is not. 23 is prime. And how many primes do I now have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I need one more prime to make a list of 10. 24 is not prime. 25 is not prime. It's 5 times 5. 26 is not prime. I, all the evens are not prime. So I just, really, I, I just have to cycle through the odds. So 25, no. It's 5 times 5. 27 is 3 times 9. 29. 29 is prime. And now I think I've created a list of 10 primes, right? and then et cetera. There's some more. And there's infinitely many in each list. Item 4. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic states that any natural number greater than 1 can be decomposed into a product of only prime numbers. Now, before we talked about decomposition in the sense of adding, so I would break 5 apart into 2 plus 3, we called this a decomposition. Well, we can use the word decomposition uh, more generally and talk about how to decompose numbers into products as well. In other words, how to factor them. So if we say, if we express um, 6 is 2 plus 4, that's an uh, additive decomposition. But if I express 6 as 2 times 3, this is a multiplicative decomposition, or in other words, a factoring of 6. So don't let the word decompose make you think it's only ever additive. We can also use it in a multiplicative context. All right, so the, again, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic states that any natural number greater than 1, so 2 and higher, can be decomposed into a product of only prime numbers. And that this product is unique. This product is called the prime factorization of the number. 
Below, I'll demonstrate how to find a prime factorization of 60 using various what we call factor trees. So I'm going to start with 60, and then I'm going to factor it or decompose it into two things that when multiplied make 60. And there's lots of ways to get this started. One obvious way is 6 times 10. And then I ask myself, is this prime? Is this prime? If they're not, then I continue to factor them. So 6 is not prime. It factors to 2 times 3. 10 is not prime. It factors to 2 times 5. And we say, OK, now we have four numbers that when multiplied will make 60. And all of them are prime. So this is called the prime factorization. So we can say that 60 is equal to 2 times 3 times 2 times 5 in no particular order. If you want to use exponents, then you can also write 60 is equal to 2 squared times 3 times 5. So the repeated uh, factor of 2, you can put that together and use an exponent of 2 to represent that. Uh, this is not the only way to have done the factor tree. I could have done 2 and 30 to begin with. But notice 2 is, is done. So sometimes people will just kind of leave that branch dangling and just continue factoring the other part, 2 times 15. That 2 is prime, so that's done. We can factor the 15 a little bit more and say that's 3 times 5. Now what I prefer to do, instead of just leaving those dangling branches like this, is to bring them down unforked. All, right, all the numbers that turn out to be prime throughout the process, just keep bringing them down from level to level, and so you can get the same prime factorization. It's two twos, a three, and a five. When multiplied, uh, you will get 60. Right? I could have done this um, a different way. I could have said, hey, I recognize that five goes into 60, and 12 is the other factor. Five is prime, so that's done, but 12 is not. That factor is three times four. And I should really have dots between all these numbers that I'm doing here. Looks better. There we go. Got all the dots. Uh, five is prime, so that's done. 3 is prime, so that's done, but 4 is not prime, that factor is the 2 times 2. And you see we, we still get the same 4 prime numbers in the end, 5, 3, and 2, 2's. And then our prime factorization is right, right here. Now, the way this was stated, I'm reading this, and I have to be careful, states that any natural number greater than 2 can be decomposed into a product of only primes. Sometimes our, our decomposition is just one thing, though. For example, if we start with a prime number, like 11, then I would I could say it's 1 times 11, but 1 is not technically called considered prime. But 11 was prime to begin with. So if you start with a prime number, then, uh, then there is no... then that is the prime factorization. 11 is its own prime factorization. We can't break it down into a product of other primes, because it already is prime. So I should probably go back here and restate this a little more clearly so that if you begin with a prime number, then that number already is its own prime factorization. Now let's look at, uh, we can use prime factorizations to create a list of possible factors. So we know that 60 is equal to 2 times 2 times 3 times 5, so let's 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. Now, to get all possible numbers that are factors of 60, we just have to choose, we have to do all possible ways of multiplying sum, all, or effectively none of these four numbers. We should always start our factors list off with a 1, even though 1's not a prime number, but it's still a factor of 60. It's just not a prime factor. Uh, and then let's keep a, a single 2, that should be in our list, a single 3 should be in our list, and a single 5 should be in our list. So all the factors, all the prime factors themselves, 2, 3, and 5, should be in the list. And then we start saying, okay, well, what if I do uh, 2 times 2? That should be in my list as well. So to put these in order, I'd want to put the 2 times 2 there. All right, the 2 times 3 should be in my list, so there should be a 6. The... Uh, 2 times 5 should be in the list, or should be a 10. So I've now done every, have I done every pair? I've done uh, 2 with itself, that makes 4, 2 with 3, and 2 with 5. Now, what about uh, this middle 2 with that 3? Well, that's just 2 and 3 again, that's 6, so that's nothing new. 2 with 5 is nothing new. 
but we could certainly do three and five. That's going to make a 15. That should be in my list. And I think I've done every possible way where I use two of these four numbers. What if I use three of the four numbers? So what if I multiply two, two, and three? That's four times three. That gives me 12. So 12 should be squeezed in right here before the 15. What if I do uh, two, two, and the five? That's four times five. That's 20. So 20 should be in this list of factors. Uh, what if I notice I'm when I'm doing how many groups of three of these can I do? I'm just choosing which one to eliminate. Like don't include the five first. Now don't include the three. Now don't include a two. So that gives us two times three times five. That's six times five. That's thirty. Thirty should be in this list. And then I can say don't include that two. So three. That's the same. That's thirty again. So that doesn't matter. And then the other possible one is using all four of them, and that gives me the sixty. Notice that when you're going this way in the list, the 60 should be in the list of possible factors of 60, but the very next one over at most will be half of will be a half of 60. Because going this way from 1, the very next number could be at at most or at least has to, has to, be, to be 2 at the at the least. And so this would be 30 at the most going the other direction. Just something to think about again. Uh, let's see if we, looking at our list here, if we got everything. Like 1 times 60, yes. 2 times 30, pairing, yes. 3 times 20, pairing, yes. 4 times 15, that works. 5 times 12, and 6 times 10. So it looks like we got all possible pairings. And we did it by uh, just doing different combinations doing uh, only one of those numbers, doing two of those numbers, doing three of those numbers, doing all of them, and that gave me all possible numbers. Number five, given two or more numbers, the greatest common factor, or GCF, is the largest number that divides each of the given numbers. One way to find the GCF of a group of numbers is to make a list of factors of each number and identify the largest common number. Do this below for each group of numbers. So when you see GCF of 6 and 18, we're looking for the largest number that divides 6 and 18 both. And the way to do this is to list the factors of 6 and 18. Oops. So let's go uh, factors of 6. Well, 1 is a factor, so is 2, so is 3. And that's half of 6, so there's the other. So 1, 2, 3, and 6 are the factors of 6. Now let's do the factors of 18. 1 is a factor, 2, uh, so is 3, so is 6. And uh, another one's 9, and then 18 itself. And notice the symmetry, right? We have all the ways that we can possibly multiply to get 18. And then we look at, we effectively do a... Uh, intersection of these two sets of numbers and then keep the largest number in the intersection. So the largest number that's common to both these lists is this 6. This is our GCF, greatest common factor. So then I would go back up to here, let me move that down a little bit, and say the GCF of 6 and 18 is 6. 6 is the largest number that divides both 6 and 18. You might see a pattern here. 6 was already a factor of 18. So, something to think about right there. Uh, let's do the uh, 12 and 30 next. Let's do that one next. So let's write down the, the factors of 12. And then the factors of uh, 30. Move this down slightly. Okay, every number that divides into 12, 1 does 2, 3, 4, uh, 6, and 12, and that's it. How about 30? 1 does, 2 does, 3 does, 4 does not. 5 divides into 30, so does 6. Notice there's a 5 times 6 right there, so now we can start doing the counterparts. 3 times 10 is in the list, 2 times 15, which should be in the list, and 1 times 30. Okay, then we just look for the number that is 
the largest that's in both lists. Well, we, it's going to be the 6 again in this case. So there's our GCF, greatest common factor. The 12 is not in both lists, so we can't use the 12. And we get 6 for this one as well. Uh, the next one, let me do a little bit of a copy-pasting here. Okay, so we want to do the GCF of 4 and 15. 4 and 15. Well, the factors of 4 are 1, 2, and 4. That's it. Factors of 15 are 1, 3, 5, and 15. That's it. And the greatest common factor in these is the 1. Nothing else is common. So we have a GCF of 1 in this case. And let's now do uh, ooh, three numbers. So you can do a GCF of more than just two numbers. Let's see what happens when we make a list of all. Let's do the factors of uh, 12 first. Let me get rid of those dots real fast. Factors of 12, factors of 30, and then factors of 42. Uh, factors of 12 and 30 have already been done, so let's do a little bit of borrowing. Okay, now let's do the factors of 42. 1 divides into 42, so does 2. How about 3? Just 3 divided into 42. 3 divides into 30 and divides into 12. So we'll divide into 42, um, and that gives us 14. Does 4 divide into 42? It does not. 5 does not. 6 does. 6 times 7. And since 7 is the very next number, then 6 times 7, and now we can start doing our pairings. 3 times it was 14, 2 times 21, and 1 times 42. All right, so we have the factors of 42, and they should be plural, factors, factors, factors. Somewhere I missed an S, factors, which means I probably missed it right there. There it is, because so I was copying that one. And we have uh, find the the highest of all the numbers that's in both lists. Well, one's in all, and sorry, in all three lists. One's in all three, two's in all three, so is three. Four is not, five is not, six is in all three, and that looks like that's the highest one. So we have, once again, six is the, the highest number in all lists, so this is your greatest common factor. And we get six once again. Okay, another way to find a GCF is to actually be working with the prime factorizations of each number. So we're going to do that below. These are the same sets of numbers, but we use prime factorizations to... Uh, determine what the greatest common factor is going to be. And I'll do a factor tree. Let's do it this way. I'm going to write, put the 6 here and put all of its factors, prime factors, here and here. So 2 and 3. And then 18 and make all of its prime factors, not 10, 18. And I'm just going to make, I'm going to make a vertical list and a vertical list and just compare the two lists and see what factors they have in common in the prime factorizations. So 2, 18 is 2 times 9, and 9 is 3 times 3. So, okay, so in the end, I can say that 18 is 2 times 3 times 3. And these are your prime factorizations of, of 2, or sorry, 6 and 18. Then you do the intersection of these. And you... Normally in in a set, let's let's go back up to uh, back up to I want to make a point here real fast. In this case where we had a six times six, yet six only showed up once in our list here. Everything else had was was paired off. When you're making a list of numbers, you don't need to repeat the six. That's true for sets, right? If I say Put what are the let's sit, let the set A be the letters of the word apple. 
well then you would not put P twice. Right? You would say there's four letters in the word apple, A, P, L, and E. And you say the cardinality of the set is four. Because sets typically you don't worry about. Uh, a repeated element is just listed once. But now we're going to allow, we're going to be thinking our sets as the elements being distinct, even if they're repeated. And so here you could say two and three are the um, elements of the prime factors of the prime factorization of six. And then two, three, and another three are the 18. And how do these relate? Well, one is a subset of the other, right? And I mean, the two and three are, are just right there. So when you do their intersection, you get just two and three. In other words, whatever a line, whichever ones that uh, can be matched with its, its counterpart, then you can construct the GCF by just doing one, two, and one, three. And you get six. Let's see how that works with the four and the 15. Well, four, its prime factorization is two and two. And the 15, its prime factorization is 3 times 5. There is no correspondence. Either they have no factors and prime factors in common. Nothing common here, nothing common here. And so we say in such a case, we get a 1 is the greatest common factor. Now keep in mind, I'm doing a prime factorization. So you're not seeing 1s in this list. Although you could, if it was a non-prime, if you allow for one in the list, then you would do something like this and say, well, ones are the only thing that match, so that's my GCF. But when you do a prime factorization and nothing matches, none of the prime factors match, then one will be the GCF. All right, we saw that pretty easily up here. That one is in both lists. It's the, com the largest common factor. And these factor trees I'm doing are only showing prime factors, and one is not prime. That's why we're not seeing the one right now. Let's do the 12 and the 30. All right, so 12 is 2 times 6, and 6 is 2 times 3. So 12 is 2, 2, and 3. And 30 factors to 2 times 15, and 15 is uh, 3 times 5. And then you align where well, we do have match. We have a 2 and 2 match and a 3 and 3 match. So And that's all that matches. So 2 times 3 will be our GCF of this, of these two numbers. And you get 6. And then we have a GCF of uh, three numbers. I'm going to do my organization slightly different, just for space. I'm going to put 12 and then put the factors underneath it. 30, put the prime factors underneath it. And 42, put the prime factors underneath it. And we're doing prime factors, right? We're not we're not doing a list of all possible factors, right? I'm not going to put all of these numbers underneath there because not all of those are prime. I want to do a prime factorization, and that's also different than just saying a list of the numbers. Uh, well, I'll, I'll make that point here in just a moment. So, two or twelve is two times six, and six is two times three. So there's the prime factorization of twelve. Two times two times three. Thirty is two times fifteen, and fifteen is five times three. So there's and just for the for interest sake, let me put the three there first. They don't have to be aligned necessarily, but I'll align them with red lines. And 40 is 2 times 21, and 21 is 3 times 7. And that's how we can break down 42 into prime factors. 2, 3, and 7 are all prime. When you multiply them, you get 42. All right, so notice that when, when you have a list of factors of 12, that's a very different thing. Like, look at this list of factors of 12. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. A prime factorization doesn't simply mean only use the numbers in this list that are prime, which are 2 and 3. Because then you would think, oh, 2 times 3 is the prime factorization of 12. Well, that's not the case because 2 gets repeated. So when you do a prime factorization, you do see repeats. 2, 2, and 3. When you do just a list of factors, you don't see repeats when you're just listing factors. So just be careful about that distinction. But now we look for anything that's common to all three. I'll use a highlighter this time. So we have 2, 2, 2 will be involved, and 3, 3, 3 will be involved. Anything to all three, I don't see it. And so our GCF will be the 2 times the 3. 
the numbers that were common to all three prime factorizations are going to be used to construct your GCF. I kind of like this way better than doing this, but you know, just different visual organizations. Okay, so you see two very different ways to determine a GCF. Uh, I think the most elegant way is probably using the prime factorizations, the stuff we're seeing right here. Now let's do a little bit of a definition. Two or more numbers are relatively prime or co-prime if their GCF is 1. Identify which groups of numbers above and below, there's no numbers below yet, I'll put them there, are relatively prime. So looking above, if the GCF is 1, then you have relatively prime numbers. So here's a GCF of 1. So we can say 4 and 5, or sorry, 4 and 15, are relatively prime. Or you can also say co-prime. They're not necessarily prime numbers themselves, right? Because 4 is not prime and neither is 15. But when, they, when you look at their prime factors and they have no prime factors in common, that's when we say that they're relatively prime. 4 is made up of 2s and 15 is made up of different primes, 3s and 5s. Same conclusion here, right? If, you, if the GCF is 1, then you say the two numbers are relatively prime. It's also true for a group of, you know, 3. If you had 3 numbers that were relatively prime. So let's do an example, some more examples on here. I'll just make them up. Uh, I'm going to put two numbers down. You just tell me if they're relatively prime. Let's say, uh, let's put two even numbers, like 18 and 2. These are not relatively prime. Or I'm going to say not co-prime. It's faster to write. Uh, because 2 divides into each. In fact, if you ever list two different, or if you list two of the same number, by the way, that's going to be not co-prime either. If I say 3 and 3, you know, their greatest common factor is 3, not 1, so the same number repeated is not, is not co-prime. Individually, they're prime, but they're not co-prime. They're not relatively prime to each other. Um, if we do... We're only interested, I should say here, interested in numbers that are whose values are 2 or higher. So we don't, don't want to bother doing a list with 4 and 1. Uh, we just don't want, we want 2 or higher in our, in our list. Uh, 18, 2, 3, and 3 are not co-prime. Uh, what if I did something like uh, 15 and 35? Well, these are both divisible by 5. So 5 is a factor of each. So... Already we know that 1 can't be the greatest common factor because 5 is a common factor. 5 is bigger than 1. So again, we have not co-prime. Now with small numbers, it's very easy to, typically very easy to look at them and say they're not co-prime. You just have to think of some number that's 2 or higher that divides into both. And if, if you can find such a number, then they are co-prime. Uh, you can even do uh, two numbers that are co-prime would be, I don't know, 6 and... 6 was 2 times 3, so I'm going to do 5 times 7, so 35 is a second number. Right, that factors to 2 and 3. This Its prime factorization is 5 and 7, right? Nothing in common. The greatest common factor is, is uh, 1, therefore these are co-prime. And if I were to do, uh, let's go 4, 2, and 7, a list of three numbers, if two of them are not co-prime, then we say the whole collection is not. Right, 4 and 2 are not, are not co-prime, so this collection of 3 is not co-prime because we have a pairing in there that's not co-prime. But if you want to have a collection of 3 numbers that's co-prime, maybe we could do 6, 5, and 7. All right, these ones are already prime, but that one's not. But when you do their prime factorizations, 2, 3, 5, and 7, the 3 sets of them have nothing in common. Right, so here would be an example of a co-prime collection of three numbers. They're all relatively prime to each other. All right, next uh, item, number six. There exist ways to determine quickly if one number divides another. The table below depicts rules for determining the divisibility of one number by the indicated number in the first column. Notice that six and seven are missing in this list. We only have we have two, three, four, five, no six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we stop there. Um, 
we will soon devise a rule for six on our own. And for seven, there exist rules, but they are more involved and we won't cover them in class. But, you know, feel free to look them up on YouTube or something. There are rules for determining if a number is divisible by seven. Okay, so using these rules, let's go over the rules first. To know that if some number is divisible by a, in this case a is two, if, referring to this, whatever number this is, if the one's digit is even. Right, so if, if you're looking at the one's digit and it's even, that's two, four, six, or eight, or zero, zero is considered even, then the number is divisible by two. So if the one's digit is zero, two, four, six, or eight, then your overall number will be divisible by, by two. To test if a number is divisible by three, you add up the digits. And if the sum of the digits is divisible by three, then so is the number. Uh, to be divisible by four, you have to have, you, you take the 10 and the one digit and form a two digit number. So you effectively just cut off the other digits. Just keep the tens and the ones. And if that forms a number that's divisible by four, then so is the, the larger number. Uh, for being divisible by five, if the ones digit is zero or five, then so will be the uh, overall number. To determine if a number is divisible by eight, you need the hundred, the ten, and the one digit, form a three digit number out of them. And if that's divisible by eight, then so is the other, the larger number. All right, so we might be doing a large number like 7,200 or 72,162. You effectively just cut off that part there. And if eight divides there, then eight will divide into all of this. Uh, number nine, if the sum of the digits is divisible by nine, then so is the number. And then finally, to be divisible by 10, you just need the one digit to be zero. Okay, so we're going to do these tests that are in this table on these numbers to see if these numbers are divisible by 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, or 10. Uh, let's do, maybe we can do something like, I'll make a column. Two, three, four, five, six, seven are skipped, eight, nine, ten. And we'll just cross out the ones that fail the test. All right, so to determine if something is divisible by two, you just look at the ones digit, and if it's even, and it's four, then uh, then two is divis two divides three hundred and twenty-four because the last the ones digit here is is even. And just out of curiosity, what's the other factor, right? You could say if 2 divides it, then there's a, another number. It's going to be 162 will be the other number that when you multiply them, you get 324. Uh, let's see if 3, to determine if 3 divides this number, then the rule is add the digits, right? This add the digits, and if you get something that's divisible by 3, then so is the original number. So I'm going to take, uh, you know, 3 plus 2 plus 4. That gives me a total of 9. Is 9 divisible by, by 3? The answer is yes. Therefore, divisible by 3. And the other is going to be 108 will be the other factor. So 3 times 108 makes 324. Let's see if it's divisible by 4. To test if it's divisible by 4, we need to just effectively cut off, keep only the 10s in the 1s position, which is 24. And if 4 divides into 24, then 4 will divide into the rest of it. And 4 does divide into 24. So 4, check. And 4 divides into, uh, it's going to be 75 plus 6, 75 plus 6 is 81. 81 is the other component. You might ask how I did that. Well, I broke up a 300 into 100 plus 100 plus 100. And then I had that 24. And I just divided all of these separately by 4. So we have 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 6. That's how I got that 81 pretty quickly. Number 5, is it divisible by 5? Uh, well, to be divisible by 5, the 1's digit has to be 0 or 5, and it's not. So we would put uh, a no here. Or maybe let's just cross it out. Not divisible by 5. Is it divisible by 8? Okay, so to test divisible by 8, you just have to look at, ooh, so this, you have to look at, if this was a larger number, if it had more digits over here, like 7, 1, you would cross them out and only look at the hundreds, tens, and ones. Well, that's all we have in the first place. So we just have to do 
a test if 8 divides into 324. And you could do this using the standard algorithm or some other method. 8 goes into 320 40 times. 4 t 40 times uh, 8 is 320. Remove that, and that gives us 4 left. And uh, we're going to have to get we have to do a fractions to get involved. So there is no, we don't get a zero remainder, and therefore uh, eight does not divide three hundred and twenty-four. Uh, number nine, the sum of the digits divisible by nine. So here we add the digits again, like we did for three. And we say, okay, 3 plus 2 plus 4, that's 9. Is 9 divisible by, by 9? Yes. A number is always divisible by itself. So we get to keep the 9. And what's the other counterpart? Well, I could, if I already know that this factoring, oh, there's a few ways to do this. Notice that we already know that 4 times 81 makes 324. And you could do a factor tree, bring the 4 down, split up the 81, but then multiply those together, recombine them, and you can see what 9 times 36 right, is what's going to give us 324. Right? So these factor trees are, are useful for determining other factorings without doing a whole bunch of uh, division uh, algorithm stuff. Uh, does 10 divide it? Well, 10 only divide it if that's a 0. The 1's position is a 0. It's not. So 10 is a no. 10 is always easy to, to determine. Okay, let's uh, test these same numbers on... This 165, just see if we, what we get. Uh, 2. 2 is a no, because 165 is not even. Right, The last digit there is not an even number. So uh, 3. Add these together. 1 plus 6 plus 5, that's 7 plus 5, that's 12. Does 3 divide into 12? The answer is yes. So uh, 3 is a factor, and let's, it's 3 times. The other factor is going to be 55. 3 times 55 will be 165. Uh, how about 4? To determine a 4, you just look at the last two digits. Does 4 go into 65? Uh, the answer is no. Um, 4 does not divide into 65. If it did, that would suggest that 2 divides into 65, and that's not that doesn't happen. Pretty much if 2 is crossed off this list, then 4, there's no way 4 can be in this list either. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, 5. Does 5 divide into it? Uh, the answer, well, is that a 5 or 0? The answer is yes, so 5 does divide into this. We can get, so it's 5 times what? We'll take this 55 and break it apart to 5 times 11, but then multiply the 3 and 11 instead. So 5 times 33 should give us uh, 165. How about 8? Well, let's, we have to do long division on this because there's only three digits here. We just go ahead and divide these and see what we get. 5 into 160 is 20 times. 20 times 8 is 160. Subtract that. We have 5, and we don't have a remainder of 0. We need fractions to finish this out if we want to. And therefore, 8 does not divide into 165, at least not evenly, not producing a whole number quotient. How about 9? Add the digits together. 1 plus 6 plus 5 is 12, but 9 does not divide into 12, so 9's off. And then 10 is off because the last digit is not 0. So really only, uh, of the list of this table anyway, only 3 and 5 divided into 165. Uh, now, uh, something I say here about the 2 and the 4, I'm going to make clear. If some number A divides B, then any factor of A also divides B. So let's invent a B and an A where A is not prime, uh, where A divides into B. So let's say B is, uh, let's go with... 30. And let's say A is 6. We know 6 divides into 30. Uh, so we would say 6 times 5 is equal to 30. But 30 is divisible by 6. So A is the 6 and the B is the 30. I could have also said a was a 5, but I want a to be not prime so that we can talk about factors of a. 
So let's say a is the 6. But you can break apart the 6 into 2 times 3, and then multiply the 3 and the 5 instead, and that just absorbs and becomes a 15. And so this is a factor of a. It's a factor of 6. And here's our uh, b again. Let's call that factor of a, just to be a parallel. So if, if a number divides, if a divides b, then any factor of a also divides b. So if Going back up to here, we would have a contradiction. If 4 divided this number, then that would imply 2 would have to divide that number, because 2 is a factor of 4. But since 2 did not divide that number, then 4 does not. So you can actually make some uh, logical conclusions here. If 2 does not divide a number, then no multiple of 2 will divide a number. If 4 does not divide a number, then no multiple of 4 will divide a number. etc. If a and b both divide c, and a and b are relatively prime, then their product divides c. Consider the examples below. Okay, we know that here's two numbers, 6 and 5, and they both divide 60. Right? 6 goes into 60 10 times, and 5 goes into 60 12 times. But they're two different numbers that divide 60. I'm not saying that they multiply to be 60, that's a different thing. But they both divide 60, meaning uh, they're both factors of 60. They would both be in the list of factors of 60. And if you factor them into prime factors, well, one's already prime, but the other factors are 2 times 3, they have no prime factors in common, so they are relatively prime. So 6 and 5 are co-prime. It's the fast way of saying relatively prime. Uh, therefore, according to what this sentence is uh, claiming, we know that 6 times 5, which is 30, also will divide 60, and it does. But it'll always be the case that if you have two numbers that divide 60, then their product will as well, if those two numbers are co-prime. Let's talk about why co-prime is necessary. Let's look at this case here. 4 and 10 both divide 20, right? 4 goes into 25 times, and 10 goes into 20 twice. But 4 and 10 are not co-prime. Because their prime factorizations have a number in common. They both have a 2. Therefore, there's no guarantee that when you multiply them, you'll get something that also divides 20, right? When you multiply them, 4 times 10, oops, there we go. 4 times 10 is 40, and 40 does not divide 20. 20 divides 40, but 40 does not divide 20. It is not interchangeable when you say, like, A divides B, therefore B divides A. That's not true. Be careful about that. 2 divides 6, but 6 does not divide 2. Okay, so this, this theorem is simply stating uh, if there are if they're not co-prime, it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't divide, their product won't divide, because what if I had changed this 20 here to uh, 100? No, oh, that's not going to work. Let's do it to 80. That'll work. Right, 4 and 10 both divide 80, and their product, which is 40, also divides 80. So if you have two non-co-prime numbers, that divide a number c, then sometimes their product will still divide c. It's just not guaranteed if they're not co-prime. However, if they are co-prime, then it will always be guaranteed. right? If you, you have two numbers that are co-prime and you have some number over here that they divide, then it will always be true that their product will divide that number as well. Right? That's what's being said here. Okay, let's get rid of that 80 and move on to number 7. It is possible to create divisibility rules for other composite numbers. You begin by factoring the composite number into relative primes, and then divisibility will be assured 
if the rules corresponding to each relative, relative prime are all satisfied. So we're going to create rules of divisibility for 6, 12, and 20. I talked about we would do 6, um, but we'll also do 12 and 20. So what this is saying to do is take 6 and factor it into relatively co-prime numbers. And so for 6, I would want to do 2 and 3, because 2 and 3 are both prime, therefore they're relatively co-prime. I mean, they're relatively prime, so they're co-prime as well. And whatever the rules are for 2 must be satisfied, and the rules for 3 must be satisfied in order to create, uh, to ensure divisibility by 6. So uh, let's go up to here and say, okay, what was the rule for 2? The 1's digit had to be even. So you would say, okay, so the, the one digit is even, and we have to satisfy the three rule. And let's go up here to the, the three rule is the sum of the digits is divisible by three. And the sum of digits is divisible by 3. Or you can say that backwards and say 3 divides the sum of the digits. All right, so if those two things are both true, then your number will be divisible by 6. Now, you do have to make sure you, you factor 6 into co-prime factors. Now, in the case of 6, there was really no option. Let's look at 12 real fast. Oops. Okay, so for 12, let me, oops, let me do my work this way. and say that these are co-prime. Now let's do the 12. 12 can be factored into 6 times 2. This is one factoring, but these are not co-prime. So I would not want to do a rule for 6 and a rule for 2 to make a rule for 12. So we have to factor this in, into co-primes. Uh, 4 times 3. 4 and 3 are co-prime, because 4 is 2 times 2, and 3 is just 3, and there's no prime factors in common from that point on. And so these are co-prime. So we can make a rule for divisibility by 12 if the rule for 4 and the rule for 3 are followed. So the rule for 4 was we do the tens and ones digit and if that's divisible by 4, so uh, we'll say keep the 10 and the 1 digit to form a 2-digit number. And 4 divides this. Probably better if I just wrote what was what was said clearly up here. But there we go. And it has to be true at the same time that the rule for three, so the sum of the digits has to be divisible by three. Or we can say that one backwards. We can say three divides the sum of the digits. Let's explore just briefly uh, why I couldn't do the, the 2 and the 6. Because when I factor this into the 2 and 6, 12, and these are not co-prime, then the rule for 2 was just it has to be even. And the rule for 6 was had to be even, and it had to uh, uh, be even, and it had to have the, the sum had to be divisible by 3. Sum divisible by 3, okay. the sum of the digits. When you put these statements together, well, one of them is repeated, and so you really just wind up getting the rule for 6 again. You see the issue? So, and that would make you think that the rule for 6 is the same thing as the rule for 12. But that doesn't make sense, because there are certainly numbers that are divisible by uh, 6 that are not divisible by 12, like 18. Right? So when you're doing this process, you have to do the factoring in such a way that you're looking at two co-prime uh, factors here. Or you can go to... 3 co-prime. Now 12, you could conceivably say this, 2, 2, and 3, but as a complete set, these two are not co-prime, therefore the whole set's not co-prime. 
so we won't, wouldn't want to do that with the 12. Let's try the, the 20. 20 is uh, 4 times 5. Uh, these are coprime. So we just have to do the rule for 4 and the rule for 5, both. And I'll copy that one there, because that's the rule for 4. And we need to happen the rule for 5, which was the the 1's digit is 0 or 5. So if both those things are satisfied, then your number will be divisible by 20. Careful, you don't just say that it has to be even and divisible by 10 in order to be divisible by 20. Because uh, 10 is a number that's even and divisible by 10, but it's not divisible by 20. So there's, you have to be careful. Uh, I didn't have us do one where we could go to 3. So let's just do one real fast. If you were to have... Um, let's see where we have options. Let me... Think of an option, 4 times 3 times 5, 4 times 3 is 12, times 5 is 60. So if 60 was our trying to come up with a rule here, you could do uh, 15 times 4, and these are co-prime, so you could do the rule for 15 and the rule for 4, but we don't have a rule for 15. So keep factoring it. That's 3 and 5, and that's 4. And all three of these are co-prime. So if uh, a number satisfies the rules for 3, the rules for 5, and the rules for 4, it'll be divisible by 60. So here's an impromptu task where uh, we factor into, into multiple, more than two co-primes and do the rules for each of those. Have to be satisfied, all of them. Okay, uh, number, this next slide here. Given two or more numbers, the least common multiple, or LCM, is the smallest number that is divisible by each of the given numbers. Okay, so this is a little bit backwards than the greatest uh, common factor, because greatest common factor, you're looking for the largest number that divides both numbers. Now we're looking for the smallest number that is divisible by both these numbers. So the LCM will be larger than or equal to these numbers, not smaller than or equal to. And one way to do this is this, this to list out multiples, multiples of each number. And it's the multiples of 15. And we're looking for the smallest number that's in both lists. All right, so the multiples of 15 are 15, 30, 45. You just essentially keep adding 15, right? Because this is 15 times 1, 15 times 2, 15 times 3, and you create this list of multiples of 15. So 60 would be next, 75, etc. And then we do multiples of 3. So 3, then 6, then 9, then 12, then 15, then 18, then 21, etc. We're trying to find the smallest number that's in both these lists. And in this case, that smallest number that's in both lists is the 15. So the, L, the least common multiple of 3 and 15 is 15. So it turned out to be one of the two numbers. Well, that's because 3 was a factor of 15 to begin with. Something to think about. Let's look at the LCM of 8 and 5. The least common multiple of 8 and 5. So we're going to do all the multiples of 8 and then all the multiples of 5. Let's start with the smaller number. Or the larger one first is to do a few of them, 8, 16, 24, 32, etc. And I'll start doing 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So far we don't have any numbers in common, so we keep going, 30, 35, 40, etc. So far nothing in common, but the very next one in the multiples of 8 is 40. Alright, so I finally found a number that's a common multiple. 40 is a multiple of 8, and 40 is also a multiple of 5. So the least common multiple is 40. And there is no other number in both lists. No, 
There will be more numbers down the road in both lists, but there's no smaller number in the list. Right, you would have seen that happen up here pretty easily, right? If I had kept this list here going, you would have seen 24, then 27, then 30. So 30 would have shown up, and there's 30 again, but we're looking for the smallest number, the least common multiple. All right, let's do 12 and 30. So instead of putting the headers, I'm just going to be lazy and say, all right, here's the multiples of, of 12. Let's just start writing them. So keep adding 12, keep adding 12, keep adding 12, uh, etc. Keep adding 12. Now let's do the 30s, keep adding 30. And we're looking for, oh, we already have it. Right? I don't need to go much further. So here's our least common multiple, it's 60. Uh, now we have three numbers. 12s, get those out of the way. 12, 24, 36, 48, uh, 60, 72, 84. Next one would be 96, then 108. I'm not sure how many I'm going to need to write here. 15s, let's get those out of the way. 15, 30, 45. Um, next would be 60. So the 60s are, we already did 12 and 30, but here's 12 and uh, 15. If I did the LCM of 12 and 15, uh, it would be 60 again. Let's put some more numbers in this list, though. 90, 105, 120, etc. And let's do 8. We're trying to find a number that all is going to be in all three lists. 8. 16, 24, 32, um, 40. Ooh, that one was close. This, I'm knowing knowing that this list is all multiples of, they're all going to be have fives or zeros at the end, so I'm knowing that I, I'm only interested in getting a five or zero at the end. All right, 48 would be next. Uh, <clears throat> then, then what? Let's... Let me get give myself a little more space to just move that over a bit. Sometimes you don't give yourself enough space. Having trouble there. There we go. And let's keep these lists going. <clears throat> well, I know I can get 8 to 40, so I know I can get it also to 80, which knows, tells me I can get it to 120. Eventually, these some of these other numbers will get there faster. Like uh, the very next number in this list would be 120. So I see the 120 showing up in both lists, and I know that I can get the eight there. But I'm still curious whether we can get to a smaller number than 120. Okay, so let's just keep working this this eight list. 48 plus eight. 56, and then add 8, 64, then 72, then 80. 80 was a, a good candidate, but there's no 80 in that list or that list, so forget 80. That's not working. Keep going. 88. Add 8 to that. 96. Add 8 to that. 104. Add 8 to that. 112. Add 8 to that. 120. So finally we got there. I think 120 is the smallest number that's in all three lists. Right, the only candidates were, were they had to end in a 0 or 5, so there weren't right that many with the 8s that ended in 0 or 5. So I had to go to, to up to 120 before I finally found a common multiple. Okay, now there is another way to do this. Another way to find the GCF of a group of numbers is by using the prime factorizations. So I'm going to show you how, how to do that. Let's go, let's do the way I did uh, 3 and 15 and then put the prime factorizations below it. So the prime factorizations of 3, well, it's just 3. And for 15, it's 5 and 3, or 3 and 5. So here's how you find, you do 
uh, an LCM, a least common multiple. You do oops, what they have in common. They each have a three in common. Whatever they have in common, you want to include once in your product. Right, so this I'm gonna make I'm gonna color code this so you can see. So one three is gonna be used. And then anything that's left over that didn't have in common needs to be included. So in this case, the five, let's make that blue, needs to be included in our multiplication. If there had been more numbers here and here, we would just include, include everything in this list and everything in this list. Put it all up there. But only things that are repeated that correspond, you put once in the list. And that'll make hopefully more sense as we do another example. So you get 15 is the least common multiple. Okay, let's try this eight and five. So eight and five. The prime factorization is eight, it's two times four, and four is two times two, so two times two times two, and five is just five. All right, they have nothing in common, so there's no green. So then we just do everything that's uh, not in common, we'll do the blues there and copy and put one copy of it there. And then we had all these things. Let's make those red and then copy them and multiply all these things. And so we really just do five times eight, in other words, and we get 40. 40 is the least common multiple. Notice that five and eight are relatively prime, so that's something to think about. Whereas up here, notice that 3 and 15, they were not relatively prime, but also one of them was a factor of the other. So the least common multiple just turned out to be the larger of the two numbers. And here, the least common multiple turned out to be the product of the two numbers. Here, we have 12 and 30. These are not relatively prime, right? 12 has 2s involved, and so does 30. So we already know they're not relatively prime. Let's go ahead and do their prime factorizations. Write them down and see what they look like. 12 and 30. 12 is 2 times 6, and 6 is 2 times 3. So 2 times 2 times 3 will be 12. 30 is 2 times 15, and 15 is 3 times 5. Okay, so anything that lines up, you put one copy of it in your LCM construction. So we just need 1, 2, and 1, 3. Anything that's left over from one of the columns, we're making that blue, you include it. And anything that's left over here that hasn't been associated with uh, its a, a partner in the other column, let's make that one red, you need to include it. So the LCM will be the product of these four numbers. All right, so that's 10 times 6. We get 60 out of this. 60 is the least common multiple. And right, that's what we got up here by just listing the numbers of 12 and 30. Now let's do when we have eight, or sorry, three numbers, 12, 15, and eight. You can see it was quite tedious up here to make all these numbers here and then look for the, the smallest common multiple. You'll see the advantage of doing prime factorizations. 12 was two times two times three. Uh, 15 was two times three times five. I'll write it in that order this time. And 8 was 2 times 2 times 2. So these are the prime factorizations of these numbers. What do they have in common? Well, only the 2s. And by in common, it has to be all the way across oops, the whole thing. All right, because this, this 3 and 3 match, but there's nowhere to go here. So it's can't use 3. Uh, this 2 and 2 match, but there's no 2 over here to align it to. So the only ones that are common to all 3 is that single 2. So we're going to have a, a, a single 2 here. And then everything else, um, let me be careful how I say this, make sure I'm saying this right. Least common multiple. Okay, make sure I'm saying, saying this right, just double checking my thinking. A pairing of three means we need to contribute a three to our list that will account for both those threes. Pretty much any number you start to put up here, if it's in 
that the green two was in all three, so that got rid of three twos all at once kind of idea. Uh, three is now in our list, so, but it, it count, canceled two of the threes across the uh, columns. So a single three will cancel both of those. Um, let's do a, a two and two there, make a single two. And then we have the leftovers. Nothing else aligns with anything else. So we're going to make that one be orange and put a copy of it there. And we had a free floating two that wasn't didn't uh, align with anything else that hasn't already been taken or claimed. Let's make that one be pink and put that there. So if I now multiply these five numbers, I'll get the LCM. Well, let's see what we get. With two times three is six times two. That's uh, twelve. That's a ten right there. And twelve times ten. And we confirm the 120 is the least common multiple. All right, so the, the single two there wiped out all those twos. Those are all accounted for. This single three accounted for those two threes. That single two accounted for at least two of the th three remaining twos. Then everything else was just uh, only one instance of it to, to be contributed, to contribute to our uh, construction of the LCM. Okay. okay, and then finally, word problems. Finding greatest common factors and least common multiples has practical uses, some of which we will see when working with fractions in the next units. But below are two tasks, you know, word problems or, you know, real life situations, if you will, or uh, situations embedded or math embedded in a situational context that require us to find either a GCF or an LCM. So Paulina has 32 red and 24 blue balloons that she can use to make balloon centerpieces for a birthday party. She wants each centerpiece to be identical. All right, so she wouldn't put some bl blue ones on, on, on one table and then on a different table, you know, put some red ones because these centerpieces aren't identical. She wants every centerpiece to be the same. Uh, what is the greatest number of centerpieces she can make? Well, clearly she can make one, right? She could, she could put all the red balloons and all the blue balloons on one table and say, there's my centerpiece. It's, it's identical to itself. I made one table. But she wants to maximize the number of tables that she can make with identical, um, identical uh, centerpieces. Okay, so we are looking for a number... We want to divide these up into uh, amongst tables, so we're going to do some division. We want to be able to divide 24 into the same number of tables, and we want to be able to divide them into the most number of tables. So we need these 32 and 24 to have a common factor. That factor will represent the number of tables. And if we want, like for example, what if we had two tables, right? Then you would divide 32 by 2, and you would divide 24 by 2, and then you would have you know, 16 red and 12 blue in each centerpiece, and you'd have only two tables. But we want to maximize the table, so we want to actually figure out what's the largest number I can divide into 32 and 24. So we're actually looking for a GCF, a co greatest common factor of these two numbers. All right, and let's do the, uh, the prime factorization approach. So let's do 32 and 24 and do prime factorization. And with 32 and 24, we have two and times 16. 16 is 2 times 8. 8 is 2 times 4. 4 is 2 times 2. So I think just a whole bunch of 2s. 5 2s multiplied together will give you 32. That's 2 to the 5th. Uh, 24 is 2 times 12. 12 is uh, 2 times 6. 6 is 2 times 3. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 3, this should give me 24, and it does. Now when you're doing uh, GCF, you just look for what they have in common, and that's all you get to put to create the GCF. So you get to put 2 times 2 times 2. Oops. 2 times 2 times 2. And we get 8. 8 is the, the largest number that divides both in the 32 and 24. Well, you can try other numbers, like 9 doesn't divide into both. 10 doesn't divide into both, 11 doesn't divide into both, 12 divides into 24, but not 32, 
And the very next one, if you're looking at just the factors of 24, after 12, it's 24. So there really are no other options. 8 turns out to be the largest number that divides into both of them. So we can do a, a total of 8 tables. And if we were to actually you know, draw these tables, let me just draw one of them and copy it. How many balloons would each table get of each color? Well, if you have 32 red in 8 tables, there's going to be 4 red. And if we have 24 in 8 tables, there's going to be 3 blue. Right, so there's uh, 1 table, 2, 3. I don't think that's what I meant to do. Not paste the image, there we go. And then this is going to copy all that. There, and then you, here's a visual of our uh, eight tables with identical center pieces, and that accounts for all the balloons that we have. Uh, the next task is Mac and Lily work at a small retail shop in Boston. Today they are both at work. They looked at the schedule and noticed that Mac works every 12 days, while Lily works every 14 days. After how many days will they both work together again? All right, so if we do like a timeline or something like this as a, as a tool now, and we'll have a Mac timeline. Let's make these straight lines. Or not. Straight line, please. There we go. And then a Lily timeline. One L and Lily. Okay. And in, uh, so we could say now is like time zero, if you will. And Mac works every 12 days. So Mac will work again at 12 and Lily will work at 14 days later. So let me just do multiples of, of 12 and 14 until we find one that's common. Right, you just kind of see where we're going with this. In other words, trying to find a least common multiple. Okay, so let's do the uh, prime factorization approach to least common multiple of 12 and 24. Sorry, not 24, 12 and 14. The prime factorization of 12 is 2 times 6, and 6 is 2 times 3, and a 14 is just 2 times 7. And we are looking for a least common multiple of 12 and 14. All right, we'll have the two in common. So we put a single copy of two here. And then absolutely nothing else in common. And so these are our, our red ones. And then we have this blue one here. And multiply these numbers and we'll get the least common multiple. So we have uh, 2 times 2 is 4 times 3 is 12 and 12 times 7 12 times 7 is 84. So it won't be up until we get to 84 days. Let's confirm that with our timeline, and then we'll call this good. So keep adding 12. We have 48 in this list. Add 12 takes us to 60. Add 14 to 42. That gives us 56, so they're not lined up. Add 12 again, we get 72. Add 14 to 56, we get 70, so they're still not lined up. But then add 12 to 72, we get 84. And add 14 to... Bingo, we found it. It's going to be 84 days before they wind up working together on the same day. All right, so here's some uh, uh, types of questions you can answer by finding either GCFs or LCMs. And that wraps up this week.